Davis, raise your hand. Let's go right to the middle with Ian. We'll get to all your guys' questions. Coach is with us for 20 minutes. Student athletes coming about 10. Go ahead, Ian. Ian O'Connor with the New York Post. Uh, Hubert, if I could just take you back a few years to your playing days. Game 594, I know you've been asked about a lot over the years. but That's longer than a few years. <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> but the call aside, you had to, at the time, make two of the biggest uh, free throws in the history of that franchise, and you did. Just what were your thoughts as you prepared to do that, particularly during the timeout? And secondly, when you succeed under pressure as a player, can that help you later under pressure as a coach? Well, you know, I just re I remember that series, um, you know, the, uh, the previous year we had won the first two games and then Chicago won the, the next two and we lost in a dramatic game five. And uh, it was another crazy and epic game five in uh, 94. And I just, um, I just d didn't want us to be in that situation again. And when I got fouled and went to the free throw line, nothing was on my mind other than making those two free throws and putting us one game closer. Um, uh, to the Eastern Conference Finals. And so um, those are great times uh, playing for Pat Riley and Jeff Van Gundy and playing with players like Doc Rivers and Patrick Ewing and Rolando Blackman and John Starks. It was a perfect team for me to go to, and I wish that I would have stayed a New York Nick my entire NBA career. But you talked about being in pressure situations and big time atmospheres, uh, you know, playing at North Carolina for four years, playing in the NBA for 12, playing in New York for four years, and those matchups with New York and uh, with the Knicks and Chicago Bulls, it puts things into perspective so that now with me as head coach at North Carolina, I've been there before, maybe not as a coach, but in terms of the atmosphere and um, um, I've been there before. So it puts me in a position where I'm calm and I'm confident. And um, I really believe something that helps is my personal career playing on the biggest stage. Just a quick reminder for media in attendance, no recording video on your mobile devices. Let's go to the middle of the room. Same area. Will Dawson, Christian Broadcasting Network. Coach, you've been, uh, you haven't been shy about sharing your faith. I was just wondering how your faith informs your, your coaching and how special and blessed you feel to be here? Well, I mean, my, the foundation of who I am is my relationship with Jesus. And so whether it's coaching, whether it's my marriage, whether it's my three kids, decision-making, everything is filtered through my faith. And so um, I can't do anything without it. Um, it's not me sharing it, it's me being me. And so, um, that's how I roll every day, and um, that's just who I am. <laughs> all the way up front and all the way left, Coach. That's our next question. Josh Grand, WSJS Winston-Salem. First matchup to the second matchup, how much of a relief do you think it was on Leakey when you told him primarily you're just going to be focusing on AJ and related to that, sight lines for shooters like AJ, RJ, Caleb, how important are these next few days to get adjusted to that in a building like this? Well, first of all, I mean, Leakey, um, not only is he a great defender, he's a versatile defender. And so I've said a number of times, I wish that, you know, in certain situations, I wish I could have cut him in half or in three parts to be able to guard three different people. And throughout a game, he's, he's been able to do that. I don't, I don't think there's been any relief. I think he takes the challenge to guard whomever he's assigned to. And... Uh, he feels very confident from a defensive standpoint that he can defend anybody out there on the floor. Uh, a number of people have talked about depth perception and the sight lines. I'm just, I'm just not there. Just give me a basketball, you know, two baskets, and let's shoot. And so I don't buy into it's a big arena, the depth perception, the sight lines. I don't know what the background is. Just shoot the ball. And if it goes in, it goes in. If you miss, you miss. And just let's just play basketball. <laughs> Coach, we're headed over to the right side. Five rows back. Matt. Matt Norlander, CBS Sports. Hubert, it's April 1st, a year ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's my oldest son's birthday. Uh, there and we it, go. And that's not April Fool's. He, is. He, turned, he turned 20 today. Okay? Excellent. Yeah, he's Happy. flying in today. <laughs> well, that's a wonderful gift. Uh, it was a year ago to the day 
when Roy's retirement was announced. Uh, I wonder if you could just take us back to what your life was like 365 <laughs> days ago and what has come for you in the past year that, you know, on this day when you're hoping you're going to get the job, just something about the profession and, and, and holding this occupation that not Roy, no one could have prepared you for that you've gone through over the past year? Well, I mean, on this day, the, the day that, you know, uh, Coach Williams uh, retired a year ago today, um, for me, it was a day of sadness. I didn't want him to go. I had been as assistant coach for nine years and I was in a really good place. I, I enjoyed working for him. I enjoyed being one of his assistants and I knew how passionate he was, not only about coaching, but coaching at the University of North Carolina. So when he officially retired, that was, that was a day of sadness for me. And so, um, and then through the process of trying to decide who was gonna be the next head coach, um, you know, it was interesting. That was the first time in my life that I interviewed for a job. You don't interview for a job when you get drafted in the NBA. Uh, ESPN picked me, so I worked there for seven years. Coach Williams, out of the blue, said we'd like to be one of your assistant coaches. I didn't go through an interview process there. And so that was the strangest part was interviewing for a job and at 51 years old for the first time you were doing something that you've never done before. And to think about, you know, I've said this before, things have been great, but things have been so busy. I haven't had time to process and think. And so to say what is going on this year, I don't know. After the season, I'll be able to have time to catch my breath and be able to think about things. but. The only time that I can feel like that I can really think about where I am and where we were going was at the, at the end of the game against St. Peter's when it looked like we were going to the Final Four. And that's why I was so emotional. It was the first time in a, in a year that I can actually enjoy the moment because in other situations, it was always next game, next recruit, next practice, next media. It was always something to go to. and so. It's been a great year, and to think that we would be in the Final Four, it's a pretty cool deal. Well, that's the next media this weekend, Coach. Okay. <laughs> Let's go to the next question. Right side front. Hey, Hubert. Brendan Marks from The Athletic. Yeah. Uh, you've mentioned throughout the year that you wanted guys to have their own testimonies, their own stories. You wanted them to experience Carolina basketball as you did when you were a player. Do, do you get a sense that they are finally maybe appreciating that more? And if so, are there examples of things that they've done or said? It looked like they were in amazement walking onto the court yesterday that have sort of gotten that through to you. No, they are. They are. They're, they're, and that's the thing, as I told you before, that brings me so much joy is, you know, I don't have to talk about what it feels like to be at a Final Four or to, or to come up big in a big-time situation with the Carolina uniform. They, they have a number of stories this year that they can draw upon, that they can grab onto for enjoyment, for peace, for confidence. And so that's great. One of the biggest things for me yesterday is watching them walk out to the floor. You know, before we went out to practice, I said, this is the first and only time I want you to bring your phones. And so we walked out there and they're like, why are you telling us to bring our phones? I said, just do it. And so as they walked out, just to see the floor, just to see how big this place was, the smiles on their faces, it was like, when my little kids came down for Christmas, they were just so filled with joy that they were getting a chance to be a part of this. And it was great. It was awesome. And so to see those smiles, even Caleb uh, said, every seat is going to be filled in our game? I said, yes. And he says, are there going to be people at the open practice? I said, yes. And he came back again. He goes, all these seats are going to be filled for the game? I said, yes. I said, is that OK? Because I'm looking to play you a lot of minutes. Are you going to be all right here, OK? And he was like, yeah, 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 coach, yeah. And I was like, OK, I just want to make sure, because I need you to make some buckets, OK? And, but just that kid-like attitude was just was great. And so for me to be able to experience that, it's interesting, I wanted them to have stories and testimonies and memories, and you know what they're doing? They're giving me more, which is really, really cool. Coach, we're gonna attempt a technology flex here and go to Zoom. Brian okay, Kennedy great. is in St. Louis. Actually, I think we got a, yeah, there's Brian. Go ahead, Brian. 
Hey, Coach. <laughs> you can't see me there, obviously. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Brian Kennedy from News 4 in St. Louis. Uh, you were just talking about Caleb doing a story on Caleb. I talked to his high, his, his high school coach earlier. What does he bring to the table that we don't necessarily see in the stat book? Well, his leadership has just developed throughout the um, entire season, and it, it, it was needed. You know, there was times at the beginning of the year that I said, you know, we just didn't have a voice in the locker room. And in order to be a good basketball team, I just really feel like you have to have that. Over the year, it just hasn't been Caleb. It's been everybody. Everybody within their personality has stepped up and become a leader. And Caleb has become one of those leaders. I mean, just in practice today, he was finishing my sentences. He knew exactly where to go and what to do. And it was almost like I had another assistant coach out there on the floor. And so not only is he having a fantastic year on the court, his leadership has really stepped forward over the last two, two and a half months. And it's been a huge benefit for our team. Coach, we're going to try this again. We're going to go to the charm city of Baltimore. Christopher Heidel is with us as well. Chris. Hi, Coach. Thanks for taking my question. Chris Heidel from Perfect Radio in Baltimore. Uh, Coach, when did, you know, when did you know you had a special team this year? I know you guys had a tough uh, beginning of the year, and I think you guys got on track in the middle of the year. When did you know you had a special team knowing that you guys could make it? We're good? Go ahead, okay. <laughs> Um, I always felt like we had a special team as soon as we started practice in the summer. I, I really did. Did I, was my hope for them to be at this place at the Final Four, having a chance to win a national championship? Yes. Did I feel like we had enough talent to do that? Yes. But I had always believed that we could have a special team. I, the first day of practice, I put a picture of the Superdome in their locker. And I talked about it at midcourt on our first official practice. And I told them, like, there's going to be a lot of hard work. We're going to have to prepare. And we're going to have to play really well. But this is, this is our expectation of this team. And I just really I wanted them to see where they were going. I told them to tell their parents, book their hotels and travel arrangements, that we would be in New Orleans in April. And the reason being is I really felt like this team had a chance to be able to do that. So I felt that way from the beginning. We're joined now by Brady Manick and Armando Baycott. Questions for the student athletes or for Coach Davis. Let's go up front to the center. Hey, Coach. Uh, this question is for you. J.B. Riggs for Spectrum News 1. Um, I asked all the players about the vibes going into what is essentially the biggest games, the biggest game of their lives. I, I want to know from you, what are you seeing from them compared to their vibes going into the regular season finale at Duke, which was also the biggest game of their lives? And um, when did you start to see that, that looseness, that, that feeling of not playing with pressure anymore or whatever, and just going out there and having fun for you to catapult you guys into the position that you are right now? Well, I, I feel like our guys are in a perfect place um, because, um, you know, one of the things that I think they have done a great job at is, is turning off or turning down the noise. And we've talked about it, that at great length and turning down that noise from the phone family, friends, and the fans, and focusing on what allows us to be at our best. And I think when you have you know, great kids and great players like Armando and Brady that understand that what is real for us to have success on Saturday is our preparation, is our practice, and how hard we play. And so that's something that, that we needed in that second matchup against Duke. And we had to block out all the noise. We had to focus on what was real for us to be at our best. And um, my belief is, is that they have found benefit in that, and they have found success on that. And because of that, what draws from them is, is a confidence to be in this situation and to be able to play the type of basketball that they've been playing all year, specifically the last two, two and a half months. We're going to go to the right side of the room, third row, Billy. Uh, Billy Witz with the New York Times. Hubert, the, the game has changed you know, a lot in the last uh, you know, decade or two, just with the emphasis on the three-point shot. You were a pretty good three-point shooter. How much would you like to play, you know, whether it's in college or the NBA, in, in, in today's game? Um, I like the NBA salaries. 
now. But you know what? I said, you know, born at the wrong time. You know, my uncle played 16 years in the NBA. He was a seven-time All-Star. And I was just a role player for 12 years in the NBA. And I made more money than him. <laughs> and uh, But um, just playing basketball would be fun. But during this time, you know, shooting from three wasn't really a big emphasis when I was in the NBA. I would say most teams shot less than 10 three-pointers on average. Everything was throwing the ball into the paint. And when you have a guy like Patrick Ewan, I understand why you would do that. But it would be a lot of fun to have – unlimited green light access to be able to shoot the ball anytime that you want it from three-point range. You want to follow? Does it, any of, I guess, your, you know, that skill that, that you had, does that, um, I don't know, are, are there things that you can draw from that to convey to your own guys shooters? Because they look so, you know, especially in this tournament, I mean, just, you know, confidence isn't a problem and uh, no, I, just... I, well, I think the reason why our guys are such great shooters I, I, is for a number of reasons. I think number one is they put in the time. Like, you don't, you're not, most people aren't able to see the hard work that these kids put in before and after practice, early in the mornings, late night. Like, it's because of hard work. Um, the second thing is, is, and something that I love is their shot selection. I don't care how good a shooter you are. If you don't shoot good shots, it's going to be very difficult to have great percentages. Our guys are great shooters. They work hard at it, and they take good shots. And so when you put those three things together, you're going to be really consistent beyond the arc, and that's something that our guys consistently do. Right side about midway back. Any questions for Armando or for Brady? Uh, Andrew Jones, Tari Illustrated. It's a question for Coach, but also a, a second part question for the two players. Coach, Arm I talked to Armando about 20 minutes ago, and he said it seems like forever since the St. Peter's game was played. Are you sensing that the guys are pretty anxious to get out there, and are you doing anything different to kind of keep them even keeled? There's an old saying that Mac Brown says, you don't want to emotionally play the game on Wednesday or Thursday when you have to play it on Saturday. And second part to the guys – are you sensing anything different from Coach this week as far as him trying to keep you guys sort of even keeled than what you've experienced before? Um, in terms of the emotion, it, that uh, it never turns off. And so there, that I want to play today, but there's enough emotion to play tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I've told the guys that whether there, there is no difference between game day, Final Four, and a shoot-around or pick up in the summer as opposed to a midday, midweek practice. Like, every time that you step on the floor, it's an opportunity to get better and it's an opportunity to compete, and it's live action. And so um, we don't have to turn it up, turn it down. It's on, and the light stays on all the time. And so, we, we, you know, today's practice is live action, and tomorrow we'll be ready to go. Brady and Armando, Brady first. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he's done a really good job of, of keeping us interested. And, uh, you know, he, he brings that energy. And I, I talked about it yesterday of how he's got these little sayings. He's always, he's always saying he said about four of them right here in that statement about live action and I'll play today. He, uh, you know, beginning of the year, we were all kind of like, oh, why, is he, why does he keep saying this? But, you know, later in the year, we've gotten to the point where it's, it's been like he, he's been right. And this is, uh, this, is, this is why he's been saying it. Yeah, I agree with Brady said. I mean, once we, as a team, our energy started to match his, especially on just a day-to-day -day basis, that's when I know the huge changes have been making. So he really has never changed his approach to any game, and I feel like we've changed our approach going into every game, and that's what's really helped us. All the way back to the left, Mike. Uh, the, the, Mike DeCourcy from Sporting News this is for Hubert and Brady. Um, when you've been talking a lot about the vastness of this arena relative to your players experiencing it, um, since we've been playing this thing in domes, I guess it's been 40 years since it was here, um, there's been a lot of talk about is it conducive to shooting. You had a great day when you played in 91, 25 points. So I wanted to ask you about what you've conveyed to them about uh, shooting in such a, a, an arena. And Brady, obviously, you've had such a great tear of making shots. and. So what you felt like uh, since you started shooting around in here? I know you had 25. 
I've, I haven't talked to them one second about the sight lines or the depth perception or shooting the ball in a dome. When I was a player, I didn't think about it either. I just wanted to shoot. And it's just, it, there's just, it's just a non-factor to me. Um, I'm not saying that it's not a non-factor for others, but for me it was never, and for our players, it's not a factor. Um, Brady's gonna shoot or Monday's gonna shoot. It's the same way at the Smith Center. If they shoot it the right way, it's gonna go in. And if we miss it, we're gonna get the offensive rebound. And if we miss the offensive rebound, we're gonna get fouled and we're gonna go to the free throw line. And statistically, we're the best free throw shooting team in the ACC. So we got three cracks at it. So I feel very confident about our shooting in the Superdome. Brady. Yeah, well, kind of what kind of what he said. Um, you know, you ne you never sh shot outside in the driveway with the wind blowing, and you miss it, and it rolls down the street. Then you haven't really shot a basketball, so I, I don't think it'll be too big of a problem for us. And I, I, I'm just excited to get going. We want to thank Brady Armando and Coach Davis for joining us here in the main interview room. You guys are going to head out to the court and enjoy that open practice. Our next activity in here at 1.15.